Welcome to the Unearthed Man Podcast, the journey becoming a conscious man, hosted by Milva. Hey all, Milva here, and welcome to episode 50 of the Unearthed Man Podcast. So uh, let me just pause for a second. Holy shit. Um, I was going to take time to let that settle in. So who would have thought when I kicked off the podcast with episode one back in, uh, it was actually 1st of June 2020, that we'd uh, hit 50 episodes before the end of 2021. Uh, my original intent was to only do 13 episodes in 2020, and but now here we are, uh, 50 episodes. Again, a bit of a shout out to Jedi Azuma, who challenged my beliefs as to how many I could actually get done in that first episode. Um, and I've had a beautiful opportunity to interview 40 odd men through that 50 episodes and uh, I'm so excited to have my guest on today is actually as part of the 50th episode so um, it's quite special uh, also we've tipped, ticked over three and a half thousand downloads so um, that's about average 70 downloads per episode which again is phenomenal I don't do a lot of promotion so you know it means that this message is getting out to a lot of people so thanks everyone for what you're doing um, before I proceed any further, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands on which we work and gather, and their continuing connection to land and waters. I pay respect to elders past, present and emerging. I pay tribute to the diversity of First Nations peoples of Australia and their ongoing culture. If, if this is the first time you're listening to this podcast, then certainly welcome aboard. Uh, you've got 49 episodes to go back and uh, catch up on. If you're one of my regular listeners, then certainly welcome back. Uh, I really appreciate your ongoing support. If you're looking to know more about The Unearthed Man, then you can find me on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, and at theunearthedman.com. If you also feel called, it'd be great if you can subscribe to the podcast via your preferred app and just also leave a review. I know a lot of you enjoy the show, and therefore, if you could give back five minutes to leave a review, that would be gratefully appreciated. Since connecting with my guest, we have built a very solid connection with us being in regular contact, albeit mainly via social media chat. Had the opportunity to attend an online gathering that he facilitated and really enjoyed the safe space that he offered to myself and the men that joined in. He's an accountability and empowerment coach, working with individuals and couples to recognize the traumas and issues they may have, overcome them, align themselves with their truth and reclaim their lives for the better. He's originally from Sydney, Australia, however, now living in Costa Rica with his beautiful wife, Carissa, and two boys, Teddy and Aubrey. He holds a double degree in science, majoring in geology and physics and education, secondary, which allowed him to be a high school science teacher for a number of years. He's gone through a massive weight loss journey, losing 60 kilo, leading him to get his Cert 3 and 4 in fitness and become a personal trainer and open the gym. After moving on from that, he pursued his dream of becoming a pilot and now is a qualified commercial pilot. Welcome to the Unearthed Man podcast, Sean Pickering. Hey, Sean. Hey, Milbo. Thanks for having me, brother. Thanks oh, for Ah, no worries at all. It's a, it's a great pleasure. I know that uh, you know we have been in regular contact and interaction. Um, I'm not sure. I think uh, we we started to connect after one of the episodes I did. It might have even been Frankie Winterstein. Um, I think because you've got a lot of connections with Frankie and Tay, um, and yeah, ever since then it's been. I just really enjoyed the the interactions we've actually have, and I'm loving the work that you're also doing for for the men out there and and the online programs you're doing. So definitely a lot of appreciation and, and grateful for, for what you're offering. Yeah, man, thank you. Yeah, it was um, around with, with your episode with Frankie. Um, yeah, long story short, Frankie and I actually went to high school together. Um, yeah, we always got on really well at high school. As life happens, you know, we sort of drifted apart. And then now with the way the world is um, and in terms of alignment and beliefs, we've sort of been brought back together. Um with that, with the amazing work that Frankie and Tay are doing as well, um, yeah, just very aligned with my wife and I and we've been to a few of their events and we've connected through that and then obviously, yeah, we just, us two, you know, you and I have just connected through social media and then, you know, I've been, as, as you mentioned in the intro, I've been grateful to have you join us in some men's calls and and just be involved in that way and just I love the work you do. Um, it's very aligned with what I do and it's just a beautiful message that, that men in this space are coming forward and stepping forward because it's long overdue that we, as men, take accountability and responsibility for what we can control and that's our kingdom, our lives, our families and, and empower each other and support each other because it's 
a bit of a dog eat dog world out there at the moment, and it has been for a while. And to just have support and connection and community, and just love it, love like you know, I using the word love for me as a man, you know, if you use it a few years back, would have felt really awkward. Mm. But you know, the world has taught us, and and being able to to step into that ability to learn that we do need to love each other, we need to love ourselves and we can't love each other without loving ourselves and that community is created. So it's a beautiful opportunity that I'm here and thank you so much and to be number 50. It's, um, yeah, it's pretty special. I didn't realise I was number 50, but I'll take that one. Always good to rack up a half century. Well done. Yeah, that, I think so. And, uh, yeah, I was, um, it, it sort of crept up on me a little bit. So I'm, uh, I'm quite excited. Um, one of the other guests, uh, Coach, Coach Phil Gerard that I'd met when I did Unleash the Beast, um, he's um, going to be the guest on episode 100. Uh, I promised him that a little while ago, so uh, I'll definitely have to put that slide. And, uh, yeah, I mean, that'd be another huge milestone to get to that point. But uh, you know, it's all about living now. Talk, talking about love, and we all want to get on to your journey. Um, I recently had a, an opportunity to go away on a weekend with um, – 20 other men and just do like a men's gathering. It was over two nights, three days. And back in the day, you know, before I sort of, you know, started to become a, a, a bit more open and, and aware of where things are at and taking accountability, there's no way I would have hugged men. There's no way I would have just openly just said, I love them. And, and cause there would have been a whole lot of conditions that they had to meet before they got my trust and they got my respect and whether I actually even wanted to deal with them. Now, this was an amazing, eclectic group of men who in my normal life I would never have come across. But I had no problem at all from the moment those guys turned up and gave them a hug and just tell them, I love you, man. Like just straight out, there is no conditions anymore on that. And even them, you know, them telling me that and me telling them that in this this beautiful, amazing space we're in, it just, it's completely uplifting. It's completely just freeing, just knowing that, it's actually not head-driven love, which is what we used to in, I think, in all the movies and all the conditioning and it comes around it that you see on all the, you know, the rom-coms and everything else about what love truly is. It's actually just this willingness just to say, you know, I, I, it doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter what you've done in your life. It, it just doesn't matter. We, we just love you anyway because you are just, you know, a human being on this earth doing what you can to, to you know, live your human life. Um, it's an, it is definitely an amazing space to to drop into. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think the big thing that comes to me when you when you talk about that experience and when you express that is the idea of love. For me, the ability now to express it to another person, let alone another man, is a reflection on ourselves. And I think as men, we're programmed from childhood to not do that to you know, that's not our role. You know, we've seen from our, our fathers and our grandparents, everything they've gone through, and they did their best they can. I'm not judging them at all. That's exactly that's the what they did the best they could with what they knew. But, for example, I think my dad said the words, I love you three times so far in my life to me. I know he loves me, but it was never expressed. And that almost builds up that lack of self-love. So being able to express to another person is a true reflection of the internal as well. So when we go through that internal process and be able to show vulnerability and show growth, it's so much easier to literally look a stranger in the eye and go, you know what, I love you. I love you for who you are. And it's probably actually better and easier to do it to someone you don't know because you don't have any of that preconceived idea. You don't have that history that you've got to go back and try and get over if there's a negative history or there's any pain or any traumas involved with that relationship. And to be able to go up to another person, I'm exactly the same. To go up to another man and go, love you, brother. Like, I would never have, you know, five years ago for me probably would never have really done that. I was always considered myself an introvert um, and just didn't really even want to connect with people. And the biggest thing that's come to me with that is when I can just express myself and be vulnerable and not worry about what may be reflected back, out of what I can receive, what I can get, if I can go with what I can give rather than what I can receive, I receive tenfold more than I can give anyway because 
there's no barriers, there's no walls, there's vulnerability, there's ownership, and there's leadership there to take that step and go, you know what, this is who I am authentically, and I'm me, and I love you for you, and we may have a different view on the world, we may have different views on things, and that's okay. And I think one of the big issues we see in the world right now is a lack of that. Mm. There's a lack of openness to discuss. I'm willing. I love being able to sit down and discuss with someone that's got a completely different view of it. That's how we learn. That's how we grow. And I know you're the same in the discussions we've had, and that's so empowering as men because we get so locked into our belief system yep. that it's, we struggle to even question our own belief system. And, and, I've, and I've chatted with you about things. If I spoke if to myself three years ago about the way I am now, I would think I'm a nut job now. <laughs> and But that's the beauty. That's life. That's growth. And that's what we need to do. And I, I sit with my clients all the time. That, that vulnerability, when we start taking that ownership and that vulnerability, that's when the love can come through because love is authentic. The emotion of love is from the heart space, not from the head, mm. and we can actually feel it. And you have that connection. You like you went out away with twenty men. Like you probably have made lifelong connections with every single one of them just over a weekend because yeah. you were genuinely yourself. And that's so empowering. And that's what is so important in relationships too. And the work that Chris and I do with couples is literally that is is breaking down this facade that we try to put up the best front to everyone rather than being genuine. You know, it's okay to be in a bad mood. Mm. It's not okay to bring other people down, but it's okay to be, you know, this is, like, this is how I feel right now and I need to process this emotion and I just need some time. What we see in relationship is projection. I'm in a crap mood, so I'm going to project that onto everyone else. Mm. And that's the big issue. And when we go in with, to, with, with love and with what I can give in this situation, even though I might be in a bad mood, okay, I need some time, but I'm going to go in and go, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to give honesty. I'm going to give that to my partner or to my friends. Go, you know, like, I hear you, I feel you, I just need some time. Yep. Yep. You know, and, yep. and that's, that's love. Honesty is the start of love. Oh, absolutely. And and the whole thing, how do you still be having a good time while I'm in a really shit mood? You have no right. Yeah, you know, that that whole projection sort of thing is like, yeah, everyone expects it because I'm in a shit mood that everyone, you know, should should respect that and therefore be shitty together. Um yeah. and, and I think you touched on the way through there. I love what you said earlier, which is about uh it's what I give out. And then, you know, I know I'll get back, but it's not necessarily you know, like in tenfold. But and for me, that's the whole thing about if I give out love with an expectation, I'm going to give it back. I'm already making it conditional, which for me is already sitting in my head. I've already actually thrown my head into this space because it's like, okay, I've, I've, I've conditionalized everything I'm actually doing. If I just give out love and when we, and for me, when you talk about it coming back tenfold, it's not coming back tenfold from that individual I gave it to. It's like I've given out love to all these people. What's actually coming back tenfold is how the universe is choosing to actually roll things back into me. So I, I gave out love and I was service over on, on the right hand side. Next thing on the left hand side, money or opportunity or someone else walks into my life who may never have actually happened. But that takes me on this, this path that I wasn't where I was going to go on. But in itself, it brings a whole lot of abundance to me. And for me, this is a piece about the unconditional love and that's and then just putting it out but surrendering to how it comes back not trying to define how it needs to come back into life and that's a bit about where i am at the moment in in my journey is this I, i'm just putting things out there and then just just allowing whatever's going to happen going to happen and, and come through um what i really like that that's I've loved this opening conversation, um, but you've alluded on a couple of things already on the way through, which is, you know, your dad probably two or three times, you know, he said he's loved you and, you know, five years ago or three years ago, you know, you would look at yourself as, as being a complete nutter and trust me, you know, I'm, I'm in that boat of it. The weekend I just went away was exactly two years, pretty much to the weekend where I, you know, whether you want to have an awakening experience or my enlightenment experience, right? So I'm even less than, than that to where I'm sitting in this space today. 
So can we talk through, you know, what was the Sean Pickering story? You know, what was life look like for you? And how did you get to this point? Like what, what actually happened and what, what, how did that transition take place for you? Yeah, absolutely. So as you said, the intro, born and raised in Sydney, uh, in the Sutherland Shire, so a shy boy from your typical nuclear family. My parents are still together. Um, the youngest of three boys. Um, you know, it all sounds sounds perfect. And, and we had a good upbringing. I'm not going to sit there and say, you know, we had a bad upbringing. But from upbringing, you still have traumas, you still have programmings. Um, yeah, went to school. Was always, you know, finished school, went to university, but was always pressured by particularly my dad. And he was, did the best he could to be really, either really successful at sport. I was I played a high level of cricket when I was younger. Um, or be academically successful. And because I was the youngest of three boys, I was basically had to beat my brothers. That was sort of the subliminal message. Um, and it worked. I beat my brothers in sport and I beat them academically. Um, and, you know, and I want to put a little asterisk next to that. These things, these programmings have also, and these flaws and faults, have allowed me to get to where I am today. You know, so often, particularly in this work we do, we talk about all oh, these traumas, they're all negative. Yeah, they've got a negative aspects. We also need to celebrate them too because they've allowed us and empowered us to get to where we are. It's about not letting them control us. So mm-hmm. I just want to put that little asterisk there. Um, so, yeah, I went to university, uh, got a double degree, as I mentioned, so science, uh, education, double degree at the University of Wollongong. Got targeted straight out of university, well, oh, sorry, while at university to go and teach at a school in Sydney, a public school in Sydney, a very successful public school. Um, it was basically the dream job as a science teacher um, to not have to leave Sydney, to not have to teach out in southwestern Sydney um, or the lower socioeconomic areas. And I was the only teacher at the school when I first started that was under 50. Okay. So it was it was an interesting environment to be in. Um, always was a little bit rebellious, even at school. Always questioned, always questioned everything. I remember getting in trouble as a student at school because, you know, I wanted extra help and that was questioned. So I questioned why you're a teacher to teachers, um, things like that. Um, yeah, always questioned things. So, but never felt satisfied as a teacher when I became a high school teacher. Loved the idea of helping, teaching, coaching students, but the structure, the box structure of school whether I was a student or whether I was now a teacher, I just didn't align properly for me. Mm. Um, so then, and I also had a lot of issues with weight growing up all the way through. I blew out to 143 kilos at my heaviest. Um, and I think that was a bit of a bit related to trauma and that sort of stuff. Also, parents were pretty unhealthy in terms of their eating. Um, so just those habits were created. I then... Really set myself a mission when my now wife, Chris, and I got engaged to lose weight and to get fit. So I always loved sport. I always loved training. As you mentioned in the intro, I dropped 60 kilos uh, in total. So really worked my butt off, really committed. Um, and then I actually got accepted into air traffic control. So I moved to Melbourne for 18 months to do air traffic mm-hmm. control. And that was a real big life lesson for me. Um, probably the hardest study I've ever done in my life and the hardest failure I've ever done in my life. Um, yeah, in terms of a failure. So got basically 18 months, got to one of the last exams, balls it up, and right. was basically shown the door. Uh, for someone that loved travelling and that was a diehard aviation fan, uh, I literally couldn't go near an airport without nearly cheering up because I put that much energy and effort into it. Um, and then my wife and I at the time just said, you know, let's just pack up and leave. So we sold our apartment in Sydney that we had. We went and lived in Canada for six months. It was the second time I lived overseas. Um, did a ski season in Canada, just partied, loved life, you know, lived yep. the life. Then went back back Europe, came back, actually went back to teaching again at the same school. Mm-hmm. Um, again, just not aligned, no alignment there at all. Um so at that time, I was doing my Cert 3 and 4 in fitness and became a personal trainer and a club manager and then had the opportunity to open an F45 training studio in Brisbane. So I moved up to Brisbane. My wife, Chris, stayed 
back in Sydney while I set it up. We basically set up this studio in four months. I was up there basically on my own, did the whole thing myself. Um, ran that for two years very, very successfully. Um, but in those two years, we had our first son, Teddy. And that was probably the moment that's when Teddy was born that changed my life onto the trajectory I'm on now. Okay. Um, and it wasn't any miraculous moment, you know, an awakening moment, so to speak. Um, but really what it was is we were running the studio. We were up in Brisbane. We had no family support. Teddy did not sleep at all as a baby. Mm-hmm. Carissa had postnatal depression. Um, I probably did too, and I, I firmly believe that men can get it as well. And looking back, yep. I'm pretty sure I did. And we were doing the best we could. I was at the studio from 4 a.m. in the morning, a couple of hours off in the middle of the day to do paperwork, and then back then basically at 9 p.m. at night um, with no sleep having literally nine coffees a day just to get through. So my adrenal system is completely shot. Yeah. That then led me to a person named Aubrey Marcus, mm-hmm. um, who is an incredible, incredible person. If anyone doesn't know him, check him out. Uh, I read his book, Own the Day, Own Your Life, and just started implementing those steps and the idea of meditation, the idea of breath work, the idea of cold showers, all these things, and just even just the way he talks about running your business, so compartmentalizing your day, mm-hmm. allowed me to get some rest, allowed me to actually do things and connect with my family again as well, and not just connecting with my clients. Um, so then, breathwork and meditation really took off for me and changed my life, and I started to see the real mental benefits of it. And then from there, I started to really just want to share my story start to get it to really open up to people, particularly my clients, um, about the struggles I was having. And it just really resonated with people I, I knew. And I just transitioned from there into uh, we sold the business. We came back to Sydney. Um, it was really deep in meditation, training, just being vulnerable, sharing my story. Was blessed to actually get selected to become a commercial pilot with an airline. I'm not going to name the airline because there's some things going on at the moment, which I'm going to. No, I can't go into. That's fine. Um, so I apologise for that to the listeners. Um, blessed, got onto that, became a commercial pilot and then was about to step onto the aircraft as an airline pilot and COVID happened. And that was my dream from a child, like from the my earliest memory, I wanted to fly planes. Yep. And, yeah, the world and the universe said, it's not going to be you, mate. And that's beautiful. Honestly, mm-hmm. it took me a bit of time. And I can honestly, in my heart of hearts, say I have no regrets and it is what it is, so be it. And it's allowed me to then step into this space where I've gone back into coaching, I've gone back into this accountability and vulnerability work. Some massive doors are opening up for me. And then with the situation back in Australia and with with the flying situation not happening, Carissa and I decided. Let's let's jump ship and come to Costa Rica because we've always wanted to spend an extended period of time in, in Latin America. Uh, we love it here. We've been here before. And the opportunity arose and we sort of just put it to the universe. We applied for an exemption. Uh, again, because of COVID, I wasn't flying. There was nothing happening with work. I was doing some online coaching stuff, which I was loving, which obviously can be done anywhere. And we got the exemption in 24 hours. So we're like, Okay. Probably a sign hmm. that we're, we're meant to do this. And here we are now. Uh, so awesome. Thanks, thanks for that. The, um, the, the interesting thing that's popped up with me uh, as you're talking through, and I want to explore a couple of other things, is um, I know sometimes I feel the universe is just this, um, you know, it's a guiding figure that sort of just got these gentle hands and it knows the path we should go on. But every time we start to stray off the path, it just gently puts out a hand, just taps us and just sort of guides us back into where it wants us to do. And then we'll go off to the left again and it'll just put a hand out and just tap us and, you know, bring us back in. So for me, I, I feel it's quite interesting because every time we, I feel that uh, the ego, sorry, the universe thinks our ego is saying, no, no, this is who I need to be. And this is what I'm going to be there. The universe doesn't, doesn't slap you. It just gently just puts a hand out, you know, like it's like you're leaving a, 
You know, one of those exercises where you've got a blindfold on and, you know, you, you need to be safe. Yeah. Just, well, just, just give you a tap. You go, okay, I've got to go back left again. And then, then that journey opens up. So it's, um, it's interesting. So, so let's go back to um, you growing up. And, and this resonated a bit with me because I also grew up in a family of, you know, nuclear family. You know, my parents, you know, married all the way through until my dad passed a few years ago. Um, one of three boys. Yeah. I sat in the middle, but my role as the middle child was to defeat and beat and be, you know, always compete against, you know, the younger and the older. So it's, uh, you know, academically, physically and, and everything else. So I, I was sort of somewhat chuckling in the background, listening to yeah the story from the younger child, <laughs> if you like perspective of that. And it was almost, as you said, it's, um, from a labeling point of view, you know, I, I'd put out and go, you know, middle child syndrome and, you know, short person syndromes and all these sorts of things. Um, but the reality is, I agree. I would not be the person I am today. I probably wouldn't be as strong, as strong as I am today. It's strong in my convictions. And it's not about arrogance and just so caught in my own belief system. It's just that where it's, it's actually strength in my personal integrity and values is what I take out of all the positive things that got me to here. So having dealing with all those environments is actually now giving me this internal strength and this internal, I don't like the term competition, but in the world where we sit today, there's, you know, if we just purely go off percentages of, you know, medicated versus not medicated, there's a 10% of the world that pretty much is, is, is sitting in a, a path that, uh, is to believe to be their truth. And I sit within that and there is alignment for me sitting in that space. And, and I know that that's also been, you know, um, a challenge a number of people have gone through, but the strength, as I said, in growing up in that environment with parents and, and with my brothers, that, that for me, I, I call on that innate strength. I've been in that, I've been, I know whether struggles are right word, but I've been in that struggle before. I've been in that competition before. And I just knew that, you know, be resilient, be true to yourself, be strong, and it'll actually turn. And then just ultimately now, the, the thing I've added onto it is, and now just surrender and allow that universe to just keep me giving me little taps as to where it feels I'm, I'm going off path and I'll land in the right spot. So, um, so for you, so I, I know you touched on that. How competitive was that? I mean, how, you know, like what was that growing up? Because I know for me with my brothers, it was, you know, down to actual fisticuffs. It was actually, you know, like there was arguments, there was resentment, there was actually fighting. There's a lot of emotion in that. So I think we can sweep over what some of those relationships look like, the, the conditions. So what was it like for you? Was it just purely a loving competition or is there a little bit more in depth to that? <laughs> no, definitely, definitely more in depth for that than the loving <laughs> competition. Um, my middle brother and I don't talk now. Um, okay. and that's okay I'm okay with that he's okay with that it is what it is you know I think the biggest thing before I answer that question like go deep into that is just the acceptance it is what it is we're on a different path we have completely different viewpoints of things and that's okay I still love him doesn't I bet you can love someone without needing to be in constant communication with them hmm. um, back to being childhood no it was definitely definitely um Never fisticuffs. Me and my middle brother sort of did. He was he was always the the agitator. So and I was always the running joke in my family is that I have my dad's arrogance and my mum's stubbornness. <laughs> and I'm 100 percent agree. 100 percent yeah. agree. Um, so and I would question things and I would fight and I still do fight for my beliefs. Um, so my middle brother would trigger me a lot and I would tend to get in trouble because I would react, which then brought out the fire in me a lot more. And I sort of didn't understand the control. Um, anger was probably the emotion that was role modeled to us the most. Um, so that was sort of how I dealt with that. But in terms of how the competition fed, you know, simple things like scores at school, like we'd get a report card and it would be, okay, let's take away the grading. What's your grade out of 500? You've done five subjects. What's your mark out of 500? Your brother got 460. What did you get? Oh, you got 462. Good job. 
Like it was down to that amount of competition, um, which again is a blessing, um, you know, but also it's a hindrance. And one of the big things I've had to learn in the last few years and something that's really coming to me even in the last few weeks is the need and the the need to kill the perfectionist in, for lack of a better term, like that drove me to be successful, but it also has driven me to be a perfectionist so much so that my imposter will come in at times and question my my own self-worth. Mm. And to set that aside and go, you know what, like looking back, who cares if I've got 452 and my other 460 out of 500? Like who gives a crap, really? You know, and... And then back when then go to the sports field, but it wasn't really with my brothers because in cricket, I was my brothers. Were, I was by far away much better than them mm-hmm. at sports like soccer. I was good at soccer, but my eldest brother Steve was incredible at soccer. It was a, again a running joke in our family that if Steve had my aggressive streak, he would have made it professionally in in soccer, which he would have. I have no doubt about that. And if I had his patience, a bit more of his patience. I would have got over that hump that I didn't quite get over at 17 to become a cricketer. Right. And, um, and uh, again, that is what it is. But that was so in terms of sport, the pressure was put on. The only time I felt like I was genuinely accepted was when I came off that cricket field having scored really a real good amount of runs or I performed extremely well as a wicketkeeper or if I was the captain, which I was in quite a few teams, I led the team in a specific way to be successful. Yep. If I failed, I was put on a different standard. So, mm-hmm. which is, you know, again, there's, again, nothing wrong with that. And the people doing that were doing the best they could. It's not a judgment. It just it is an observation. But like you said, that has allowed us to get to where we are. So that drive to be the best that I can be has also allowed me to take risks. I could have easily still been a teacher now for 15 years, hated my life, kept in the depression, kept all the weight on, you know, not chased the dream of being a pilot and, like you said, the universe guides us. I 100% agree the universe will guide you. I also believe probably a little bit more that if you don't listen, the universe will start to slap you just a little bit harder. <laughs> and for me that happened with aviation, as I talked about, like my dream, you know, it's aviation with being a traffic controller, that was a hard sort of thing. And then with flying, finally getting into it, sort of never having the money growing up, then finally getting accepted, moving away from my family for a bit. And then COVID happened. It was kind of like it was the final realisation, the final straw that, okay, it's probably not going to be your journey and that's okay. Um, but, yeah, that perfect, that driving that competition from being a child really drove that, need to be a perfectionist in me mm. at times. And it, it brings up a fear for me at times that I'm not good enough. Um, and it's not until I show that vulnerability with myself and realise that no one's perfect. Like, you know, there's these guys I've talked about. I mentioned Aubrey Marcus. Like I'm doing a course with him and Eric Godsey and I had these, these guys on a pedestal until I literally did Zoom calls with them and they're like, they're just blokes. They're like, no, I have exactly the same struggle with you. Just because I have a multi-million dollar business doesn't mean I don't question every decision I make. We're like, I'm like oh, okay. Vulnerability. Accountability. Mm-hmm. Okay, I've made this decision. Was it right? Yep, yeah, cool. Was it not quite correct? No, okay. Then let's just, how can I respond? Okay, I can either play the victim or I can go, you know, like I made that mistake and I need to move forward. And those traumas from childhood, in vertical commas traumas or programmed responses, have allowed me to be able to question things. I questioned all the way through my childhood. It started out as why can't I just be accepted? Because I literally, going back to my childhood, my grandfather rejected me. He completely hung out with my, you know, would, would give everything to my two brothers. But my dad's dad, would, the only thing he'd ever say to me was a grunt, literally. Right. And I never understood that. And I still don't understand that. And that, that just is, and that's okay. But 
that made me question. But if I hadn't, looking back now in hindsight, hindsight's a beautiful thing, if I hadn't learned that ability to question things, I would not have questioned whether I was in alignment as a teacher or whether I was in alignment as a PT or whether I was in alignment. And it wouldn't have got me to being able to be an accountability and empowerment coach because I would still be stuck going, no, nah, I'm all good. I don't have any issues that I need to work on. I'm perfect. Everyone else in the world is part of my language fucked. It's mm. not my fault. Um, I'm going to pay the victim, which is the biggest mistake we can make yes. as individuals. Vulnerability, honesty, and acceptance are how we become empowered. And that's what my childhood has brought me. It's taken me a long time. I'm 34 now. It's taken me probably 30 years <laughs> to get to this point to learn this. But it's that willingness to question and to learn. Yeah. Uh, and, and that's beautiful. And I think, you know, it's interesting when I get on there, these conversations that, um, you know, one, I love learning more about people, but two, you learn more how closely aligned you know, paths have been, uh, albeit probably 20 years difference in, in, in you know, where I got to. So, um, but the, the interesting thing you talk about, yeah, at 34 is, um, I actually did a two year course at around about similar age where I actually got to study myself for two years and all the stuff that I know now, I actually did effectively, you know, 20 odd years ago, back, back in the early 2000s. And it's really strange to go, the universe put me into that path and into that course. And then I just disappeared over into this other ego driven, I'm now over here. Although there's a lot of value that's come out of that, particularly, I don't think my relationship with my wife, we would have got to, you know, the 20 odd years that we've got to, if I hadn't have done that and me giving up drinking wouldn't have happened if I hadn't have done that. So there's it's a whole lot of things that took place. But I'm looking at all the things and all the readings and all the the latest stuff that people are writing about. And I go, hang on a minute. If I go back, that's just rebadged all that stuff about conscious and subconscious and everything that I actually learned and studied 20 years ago. So you're right. So, you know, whether the universe gave me gentle taps or two years ago, it actually gave me a massive slap <laughs> and said, look, we're sick of you running off and doing your own thing. We're going to just throw this into you. Um the other thing that I just want to touch back on competition and, and I think it can be seen as a dirty term, you know, in the space that we, that we operate in when we're, we're coaching people and we're, you know, in this world of self-development competition's okay. As long as it's not the detriment to the other person, as long as it's actually not degrading or bringing down the other person, as long as it's not throwing it back in their face, actually having positive, strong competition actually grows people it grows resilience it grows persistence it grows an understanding and enables when you um you know when you come second when you come third that's not a failure it's really funny we, we look at the person who comes second in the olympics and we go they failed like this is the second best person in the world in that sport right yeah. so but from that that competition there's no detriment from it it's like so they can go away and grow and learn what was it they didn't do was there something in their training where they slackened off a little bit was there something that they just didn't quite go that or was it just a physical capability the other person was just physically stronger what's their acceptance process so again as long as the other person's for me as long as i'm not throwing it back in someone's face and going i am better than you you are useless you're not great you can never beat me type of just you know rubbish that's just ego egotistical bullshit as long as it's like i'm there saying i may have beaten you today or i competed against you today. thank you for making me a better person and getting me to the pb what can i do to help you how can we continue to grow and compete together what i love seeing is you know people who are now playing afl sport you know who said that they competed with each other back in junior football. I've known them since a junior, but they've probably, if they've done it right, they've both grown together to be able to be in this position where they're still competing against each other. But And if they can have it from a positive de development aspect, um, as I say, like the rising tide lifts all ships. The key thing about it is that that's what we're going to do in the world of competition and maybe not see it as negative, but see how we can reframe it to, to be to that point. Um, so that's just a, a bit of a, a take on what you're talking about. The um, so you've been through all this. You've obviously got to the point, as you said. It, it sounds like in the background, you know, you you were doing dual things were actually happening. So you're running the gym. Um, 
you know, there, there's obviously you're dealing with, you know, males, females, a lot of stuff's actually happening. And gyms can be rather superficial. We can be working on the physical and not take a step back um, and, and doing the pile stuff. So how much of the gym work that you were actually doing and particularly your own journey and congratulations on on the dropping a 60 kg like that's phenomenal um you know that sounds like what that's probably in the order of you dropped nearly 60 percent of your own actual weight to get to that point um which is just amazing that in itself is a is a journey so the gym stuff dealing with people who are just there physical but not doing the emotional and everything else how's that sort of played out for you yeah, firstly, cheers. Thank you. Yeah, 60 kilos for quite a lot. Um, and how's it played out? It's interesting. Um, Carissa and I, when we opened the studio, took a completely different approach. So the, the demographic that we were in was actually middle-aged people. Uh, kids finishing late in high school, finishing school, going to university sort of age. Um, you yeah, know, ranging from the, the, the average age was about 43, I think, from memory. So completely different to the traditional in inverted commas F45 target market. And mm. um, we took it differently. So we just want people to have fun and and lose weight. And I've, I, I have constantly have people coming up to me going and, and clients and members come and going, how did you lose the weight? And the biggest lesson that I learned in that journey for myself, and this is something I talk to people all the time about, is I questioned and I tested. The thing that I find with particularly health and fitness, everyone puts a label on it and there's a one-size-fits-all approach, which is rubbish. Hmm. It's, okay, you do this training program, you do eat just this food and that's all you have to do. There's nothing to do with the emotional, the hormonal, the spiritual aspect, the how you view yourself, the external stresses that all play a, a massive part. Like if you if you go down a bit of a rabbit hole with the way we're made up as people, you know, there's more microorganisms in our body than there are human cells in our body. So if we're not treating that part, how, just because we lift some weights and go for a run around the block doesn't mean things are going to work. Or you might be stressed out of your mind at home or at work and those stress hormones are causing you to binge eat or they're causing you to starve yourself or they're causing you to do these things. We have this crazy idea that if I look good, I'm going to feel good. And, yes, there is an aspect. Don't get me wrong. If you look, if you look better, you feel better. Mm-hmm. But there's a whole biochemistry going on. There's a whole aspect, and that's part of the work I do now is looking at the physical, the mental, the emotional, and the spiritual health, and combining it all. So when we had clients come through, so an example, they come to do a challenge, for example, because you know marketing, business wise, challenges are very successful, yep. um, and they come to do a challenge for eight weeks, and they would come and go, and they get to the end of eight weeks smashed it they've they've gone from not training at all first few weeks they might have done two or three sessions a week perfect built it up to nearly daily sessions over eight weeks with some rest periods we've worked out with the local physio you know to have a program them in terms of massage or recovery worked all out with them and they've lost six kilos in eight weeks they go but the person other person lost 10 like, yeah, the other person was 140 kilos and you were 82 kilos. Mm. But this expectation of looking external is so exemplified in the fitness industry. Of, and all you have to do, like, you go onto Instagram or on social media and look at a fitness person. Yeah. It's this idea that you have to look like this. You know, I got down to, I lost 60 kilos. I got down to about 8, 9% body fat. And to be honest, I was a hell of a lot more depressed than I am right now. I'm sitting around 90, 95, so I'm about 10 to 15 kilos heavier than I am now. Sorry, I am now than I was back then. And I can allow myself to go and have dessert when I, you know, go out with my family. And the joy of bringing all that together and, you know, like 
I'm emotionally healthier. And there are some people that thrive at that body fat and that's just what they do. They love it. They just, like athletes, they deal with it. But this driven competition, like go back to the idea of competition, it's so easy in a weight loss journey to become negative if someone else is doing better mm. because it becomes this competition. And I used to really not like doing a lot of challenges in the studio because people would do it for the prize and not for actually becoming healthy. And we used to talk about it all the time that you, people would actually get their best results in their second or third challenge that they did if they consistently started training because their bodies adjusted. But it wasn't even that their body had adjusted. It was that their mental aspect had adjusted. And they're like, you know what? I'm going to have a rest day today because my body's telling me I need to have a rest day. Mm. Or you know what? That cup of coffee is okay. Even though the meal plan that's been sent to us says don't drink coffee, if you're desperate for a coffee and it's going to make you feel emotionally and mentally healthier and it's going to stop you from having a fight with a colleague or fight with a family member and then that fight's going to then create a hormonal response in your body which is going to cause you to binge eat, then you're not better off having that coffee rather than that binge eating pizza at midnight. Yeah. Things like that. So that aspect of going, you know what, like, I need to take ownership and go, you know, like I can sit here and go, I can have a coffee or I'm going to have a rest today and not feel guilty. Hmm. I think there's a big push in these sort of aspects to train twice a day to do everything. And if you can do that, great. If your body can do that, that's awesome. You know, you, you know about AFL. I know about AFL too. There's athletes that need extra rest days hmm. and it's built into their program. And they're probably the fitter of the better athletes. You know, I've I've worked with people like I know people that are in these industries. You know, Frankie, you know, we talked about Frankie yeah. at the start. He was, you know, professional footballer, played for his country, mm. multiple countries. And he has rest days. You know, he's like, it's this idea that we constantly have to hammer ourselves. And it's not even with, with physical training. And this is, again, I'll, I'll sort of segue into a bit of what I do now. We tend to beat ourselves up way too much. And going back to those childhood programs we were talking about and accepting the benefits of them because it's so easy to always be stuck in the negative and beat yourself up. Like, you know, I might get an argument with, with Carissa. All couples argue that's life. Yep. And everyone disagrees. That's okay. But if I'm going to sit there and beat myself up about it, then that's going to make it worse because it's going to be in the top of my energy, my energy levels, universal energy levels are going to be negative. I'm going to be sitting in a negative frequency. So then everything that's going to trigger me is going to trigger me and I'm going to respond in anger or frustration or out of fear, out of fear that, I'm, you know, the whole idea of walking on eggshells, we hear that all the time. And that's just a fear response of I can't be vulnerable and be myself. And, you know, so, and that's another thing that going back to the physical aspect, People train themselves into the ground, literally, out of fear of failing to hit a number on a scale. Yep. And I can tell you right now, in my weight loss journey, you can ask Carissa, and I'm sure like, when we catch up, I'm sure you can ask Carissa about this. I was an asshole in my weight loss journey mm. because that was my focus. Yep. And... Not 24-7, I wasn't an asshole, but if I was missing a training session, I was triggered. Mm. But no, no, I want to lose, I need to lose this weight. I need to, I need to hit this number, I need to hit this number, I need to hit this number. And that was driven by my coach. And but that's that's not on my coach. That's on me. That's my responsibility to get a step back and go, you know what? I need to take time off. And you know, it, it caused issues in our relationship. And it wasn't until I actually stopped and went. Okay, I need to balance. And even business, same thing with Teddy not sleeping, with Chris being first night. It wasn't until I actually stood back and we went, okay, you know what? I need to get a studio managed to run this. And I need, I've got a responsibility to my family and to myself and to my own health to show that I need help. Mm. 
So it's, I know um, that's a bit of a tangent, but I hope that no, no. sort of answers. No, no, I, I, I loved all that. Um, you know, for, for me, the, the aspect of, you know, hitting a number or pushing myself or, you know, even the whole, you know, whether you end up, you know, overweight or whether you end up like trying to t- attack that 8% body fat or whatever else. For me, it's, it's just a, we talk about drugs and alcohol as these addiction things, right? They themselves become a externalized addictive behavior. And and just another another excuse for the ego to be able to say, see, I told you you couldn't actually hit that that thing. I told you that you couldn't get to that percent body fat. Like all we've done is, for me, there's this constant. When we live in a world of externalization, you might say, cool, I've given up the alcohol, but now I'm 30 kilos fatter, right? So all I did was I stopped one thing, but I've just diverted. I've just re externalized. So. For me, there's a lot of that that's going on. And so, you know, when you talk to the fact that it's just not, you know, it's not physical, it's a physical, mental, spiritual, and emotional, you have to tap into every one of those different aspects because you still have to question. So have I just re-diverted my externalization into something else? And and I know for me in, in my life, when I look back, you know, yes, I gave up the drinking, but then again, you know, I was running in the 80 odd kilo mark, right? So I'd gone from, it's okay to eat all this fatty food. And, and even now, you know, I, I'll talk a lot about, you know, how I eat and, and, and everything else, but I still know that, you know, there's aspects of me that, that, that um, the imposter or the shadow aspect of me is, you know, I'm just going to go and eat as much fried chips as I can, you know, um, because I love it. Now that's getting less and less type of thing, but um, it's interesting that, that you're talking to that space because I completely agree. It, it has to be, we have to work our way through and, question what why am i now externalizing in this direction why am i externalizing here why have all of a sudden i've just linked in like i've hooked into that latest netflix series like why am i actually over there why am i not what am i running away from and and when you talked a lot earlier about um growing up and it's that um we've learned that ability to or there's an innate thing around i'm just going to question and i'm going to question whether it be authority or decision making or what's happening you know Again, sometimes those questions can be very external questions. Why is this happening to me? Why is this going on out there? And, you know, how do we use that questioning in a very positive, loving manner to go, okay, so what's sitting with me at the moment and, and what's actually what's happening? Um, I know for me, uh, since March, I've probably dropped about six kilo, which I've loved, but it's just been organic. I haven't hit a target. I didn't do anything. I just went back and started to eat what was right for me, what my body wanted me to actually eat. Sure, I've had ice cream along the way and I've had plenty of pizzas and plenty of hot chips. But the thing is, I haven't condemned myself for it, but I know that my routine is actually the routine that I wanted and it's okay. And I've just been on this journey and naturally my weight is just, you know, I'll jump on the scales every day. But I used to, I used to be like, shit, you know. I've put 200 grams on since yesterday, right? Which just means yeah. I probably didn't piss enough, you know, or you know, whatever it was, right? <laughs> or I just didn't have enough shit, whatever, like, you know, whatever that small thing was. But but now I'm like, oh, yeah, so that's just what it is. It's, um, so, yeah, I think I love what you're talking about, the fact of how you work with with the people. So let, let's talk a little bit. I, I, I want to give you the opportunity to talk into, you know, the couple stuff that you're actually doing because I love, I love that piece of work because there's one thing that doesn't sit comfortable with me a little bit is there's a few people with myself and Jackie you know who come to us and go you you guys are couples goals you know but they don't really know us sure we've been together for 20 odd years and sure you know yeah we have a lot of smiley photos up on you know Instagram and you know um to to let everyone know I I get triggered when Jackie puts stuff up about me on Instagram like when she shares stories about me just even you know recently of me our bodyboarding right I I get what the fuck are you doing that for like I get really triggered by it but I've got to understand it's actually her just sharing her love for me and that's okay I I I've, I've got to stop stopping her doing that it's it's okay this is just her expressing just going, I just love this man and I love what he's actually doing. And I've got to get over my own ego and go, yeah, sure, share all that stuff out. It's okay, you know. Um, so, yeah, even that, there's, you know, 20 odd years and there's still, oh, you know, yeah, the, the anxiety kicks in and you get tense. So, can you talk into where you and Chris are at? Because I see, you know, again, you guys um, 
obviously have a beautiful relationship, but as you go, there's, there's always rocky road here and there, and there's the argument here and there, and, you know, we'll somewhat be triggered, but the work you're doing with others, can you talk into that for us? Yeah, absolutely. And I'll, I just want to quickly touch on one thing that you were just talking about, which leads into what I'm going to talk about anyway, is that idea of, like you were saying, questioning, internalising. The biggest question that, and this works with couples all the time as well, so that's why I wanted to drop it, was the question that we ask ourselves is, what expectation am I putting on myself? So whether it be in a weight loss journey, whether it be in anything, one of the big things for me that I've started, particularly since I got to Costa Rica, but I've been doing for quite a while, but really in depth now is, is writing. So journaling, just typing, like potentially a book might come from it. I don't know. And that's the, I don't know is the beautiful part. That idea of, um, I can't remember the, the author's name, but he wrote The Art of War. There was a section in that he talks about his process and his habits and he'll sit down at his computer and work for an X amount of time. No editing, no reading of what he's written, nothing. And that idea is a real manifestation of doing things without expectation, just showing up and doing it. Like you talked about, you know, you, it's organically, your weight loss organically happened because you haven't put this expectation of, I have to lose 200 kilos, to, sorry, 200 grams, 200 kilos, 200 grams today. Um, these expectations actually cause, like I said, causes to go into the ego, but then cause stress hormones, cause all these biochemical responses, which actually stop us from getting to where we want to go to. Or, that will cause us to, you know, pornography, for example, used to be a big issue for me, a massive, massive issue. And it wasn't until I stopped, not caring is not the right word, but stopped with the expectation of I can't do this and just went, you know what, I'm not going to have that expectation anymore. If I have this expectation of I'm not going to look at anything, that sits in your brain the whole time, in your mind the whole time. And if you're addicted to something, and you'd be out talking to this with, with, with alcohol, if you have this constant thought pattern of it, if you're addicted to it, it ain't going to stop it. It's going to make it worse. Mm. So doing things without the expectation. And with couples, it's super, super important that we try and do things without expectation in our relationship. You know, like Chris and I, are just we're normal people and – the biggest thing for us, and it helps with, with other couples that we work with, is we need to take responsibility as individuals for ourselves. So often in relationship, people try and fix the other person. Mm. But the issues you're trying to fix are actually mirrored from the crap that's going on inside you. And if you're not willing to fix it in yourself, it's going to keep coming up. It's going to keep coming up. You're going to keep projecting. You're going to keep throwing it out there for people. And that's the biggest issue that we find, you know, and, and we fall into it. We're not perfect. Don't get me wrong at all. You know, I know when I'm getting triggered, it's probably because I'm in a crappy mood and the kids are frustrating. So it's easiest to take it out on Carissa mm. and vice versa. It's easy for her to take it out on me or give me insult and trigger or whatever it is. But that comes from expectation of what the other person or what you expect the other person to give to you rather than what can I give without expectation of what I'm going to receive. If we go into our relationship with honesty, vulnerability and a lack of expectation, not that you don't expect them to, you know, to be committed, that's, that's a different story, but expectation of an outcome. Of I'm going to do X, Y, and Z because this is then going to mean I'm going to get X, Y, and Z. Mm. No, we do things because of X, Y, and Z. And then you get A, B, C, D, E, F, G all the way through because you don't have the expectation. The connection will be built because of that. You'll be able to verbalize and communicate and talk on a deeper, more connected level. And when you do verbalize and communicate on a deeper level, the expectation is dissolved as well. And one of the big things that we like to do with couples is actually get them to write the things that piss them off about the other person. Yep. Don't share them. Tear it up, chuck it in the bin, burn it, put it in your fireplace, whatever you have to do. You do that and then you write down, so that might be two or three pages, just things that are triggering you. And then you do that with, you do the opposite, things that you, 
grateful for. Not things you love about the person, things you're grateful for. So it can be the little, littlest thing like, you know, Carissa will let me go for a run in the morning. I'm super grateful for that. You know, something small, something that people go, that's just an intangible, that doesn't matter. Yep. It makes a massive difference because it means I can clear my head, I can get, an, get a workout in, I can connect with nature, and now I'm ready to go for my day. Like things like that. And if people want to share the things that trigger and Chris and I really share the things that trigger us now, we'll, we'll literally be in the middle of a conversation and be like, hey, you started to trigger me. Again, but again, I'm not, we don't say that to trigger the other person. We say that this is a boundary and I'm verbalizing my boundaries. I'm going to stand strong in my boundary and that's starting to be crossed. And this frustration or this anger I am feeling is justified because my boundary is being crossed. Hmm. So often, I think particularly for men, we're told that anger is bad. Yep. Because of in inverted commas, toxic masculinity. And I hate that term. I'm not going to go down that rabbit hole. It pisses me off so much. But anger can a, destructive anger is bad. Yes. Anger from feeling your boundaries being crossed and being able to be controlled and verbalise that or controlled and go, you know what, like this is triggering me, I need to step away, is very, very helpful and healthy in relationship. So feeling that non-egoic anger and recognising it and understanding it before it becomes egoic and explosive and volcanic and, you know, rage-filled is really, really healthy. I think we're men and this is... You know, I believe personally one of the big issues with domestic violence, particularly in Australia, is we as men, and I'm not justifying it, don't get me wrong, it's disgusting. Domestic violence is disgusting, so there's no, I'm not doing that. But we haven't been taught that it's okay, A, it's okay to be upset because if a boundary is being crossed, and B, how do we actually express that in a healthy, calm, collective way? Yes. Or if you can't be healthy, calm and collected, how do I do it? How do I step out in a controlled manner and release that anger? Like a, a thing that I do daily for myself first thing in the morning to make sure I try not to get to that point where I'm angry is primal screaming. Mm. I'll go to the beach and I'll just scream and feel anything, any tension in my belly, I'll just release, things like that. Going to the gym in a healthy way is like that. You know, there's a reason that, Men like to go do martial arts yep. and women as well. Don't get me wrong, but there's a reason we're drawn, that testosterone is drawn to that. We need to release that. Um, and then having habits in a relationship is really, really powerful. Individual habits is really, really powerful. Um, basically, things that you need to do. So, like I said, Chris allows me to go for a run in the morning or go to the beach. Like, I won't run every day. I might just go to the beach and just meditate or do some primal screaming or do some breath work um things like that um you know when carissa needs to to read a book cool i'll take the boys in the pool or yeah it's that communication like like you talked about you know and and removing that ego the biggest thing we find in relationship is ego and i don't know if you've ever read a, you know some stuff from eckhart tolle but he talks yep. about ego you know with conversation you know if, if ego comes in it's no longer two people conversing it's four people that's right. So you're now in a group conversation and the two that are conversing are the two egos, so the actual two people will never actually hear each other. Mm. And when I read that myself, that was like, holy crap, because I am still quite an egotistical person, a lot less than I used to be, but I was, I was terrible. I was so deep in my ego mm. and everything was ego-based for me and even going back to questioning, you know, questioning out of ego, like you said, um so yeah so when we work with couples we really try to nut down to what's going on and we also find that a lot of couples it's quite interesting the dynamic with couples that there'll be one that tends to be more of a people pleaser and one that tends to be more of for lack of a better term the controller yep. um and i don't mean that in a you know again a, a negative way just they like to express they like to make sure things are done or they you know if there is a just a um an argument, so to speak, or a disagreement, the control wants to get it done, wants to sort it out. And that's me and my relationship with Chris. Chris is a people pleaser. And 
being able to step back and go, you know, you need time, that's cool. And communication. So if you are a people pleaser person, having that ability or that vulnerability to go, you know, like I need some time and actually verbalize it. Because I know for me, if I, as that in inverted commas controller, um, don't hear that, I feel that, that that wall that gets put up is almost passive aggressive. Mm. And I see it a lot with a lot of couples too. When you actually get them to, again, write those things out, those things that you know, piss them off at their couple, that'll come up is the, the, the people please will go, they just always want to get shit sorted and don't ever like, you know, stop going on about something and the controller will go they just they just shut down they just put up a wall and they just never actually communicate with what we need to do and where if we can both sort of take a step towards the other person in terms of personality it all starts to dissolve away yeah and that communication starts to be effective you know the, the people go, you know like i just need some time so chris will go to me sean just give me 10 minutes or give me i'm just gonna go for a walk i don't want to talk about it right now and yes, that bruises my ego at times too, especially if, it's, if the anger is not directly caused by me, my ego will get a bit bruised. Um, but then also at times I, I'll need to just say the same thing. I'll, that I need to recognize that I need to step away. And this doesn't need to be sorted out right this second. We can talk about it in 10 minutes or, you know, I just need to do some breath work for five minutes to calm down, to release that anger. I need to go to some primal screaming. I need to go to the gym for half an hour, whatever it is. So I think that definitely in terms of doing stuff with couples is, is really, really important is realizing where you are as an individual and trying not to get back from your partner, but just do what you can do and control and, and heal your wounds and work on yourself. And once you do that, you'll see any of the perceived shortcomings will start to dissolve away and you'll actually start to connect on a much deeper level. Yeah. Uh, thanks for that, man. Um, I really do appreciate that. Um, and in the world of unedited live, if you need to jump up and flick your light on, because I know it's actually now dark in uh, Costa Rica, feel free to do Sorry, that. I can, I can chat for a sec. The um, That's why it was sort of funny, Sean. It was a beautiful thing with Sean and um, – <laughs> The sun's come up here and it's going in Costa Rica. Next thing, Sean's got his nose almost up to the camera so that he can actually see me. It's going completely dark. It was beautiful. Um, so two, a couple of things came up with me when um, when you spoke th- through through what was happening. And, and again, in our space, first thing is learning that you're with the person who they are, not the person you want them to end up being. And if from day one they're not the person who – you're not willing to accept them for who they are, then go and find the person that you're looking for that is already who they are. Don't try and change that person into an image or into a thing that you would like them to be. Now, that's not saying that that person will not grow and develop and can't do their own development and can't take accountability for anything else, and they may end up moving, which is interesting because it goes the other path is that the person they may end up becoming is not the person that you wanted to be. And if that's the situation, then again, you may not, that your journey may have come to an end and it's, it's, not, it's okay to have that journey end and not try to bring them back to where they were. The other thing that I've learned and, and I now take on a lot more accountability in my space is, is, when, is when Jackie's upset. Uh, it's, it may have been triggered by something I've done, but it's her emotion. It's not, it's not about me. And even... But I'm going to be willing to take on the feedback if something I did created that emotion. So, yeah. so I've got to stand back and go, okay, what's happening for her is happening for her. And the second thing that I've actually learned now, because you know, I, I I flip between people pleaser and controller, but probably more dominant controller, is for her people pleaser side, she at times may not want to or may feel uncomfortable in raising something that I've done. So I can, yeah. on her body language, I'll actually stop and say, okay, what's happening with you? But, you know, like I'll give her that space and say, okay, what's going on? Do we need, but, but let's have a chat. And just learning to be able to sit there in silence, not saying anything on the way through, not interjecting, not, you know, just being there for her to talk through. And if as she's talking through this stuff that she's either giving me feedback or projecting onto me, it's just, willing to just listen to it not defend yourself 
not be offended by it and just allow her to actually talk through what's actually happening. What we find in doing that now and, and similar, she creates that space for me. She goes, hey, you're looking a bit flat. You know, what's happening with you? She does the same thing for me, which means we're dealing with it earlier and more more likely at the time it's occurring as opposed to one or two days later, which is when the actual anger, frustration, that's going to be a different conversation because I'll go, what the fuck didn't you raise this two days ago? Or, yeah, like mm-hmm. you can get in this whole, you know, space. So, yeah, and that's and your journey. And, and that's the whole interesting thing is we're learning that now, 23 years or our daughter's 24, so I probably should say 25 odd years into yeah. our relationship, right? Yeah, you know, whereas people look at this and, as I said earlier, people go, oh, couple's goals, you last that long. It's like I often look back and go, how the fuck did we actually last this long? <laughs> like how did we even get to this point? Because of all the stuff we're doing now, if we didn't do that for the first 20 odd years, it's like, holy cow. <laughs> like, you know, um, obviously we've put up with a lot of shit that we both haven't dealt with on the way through. Um, so it's a really nice space for us to, uh, to, to land in as well. So thanks for talking, you know, um, and being open and honest about, you know, bringing yourself and Carissa into that piece, because I think that's the whole thing about if, if we do it, and we're going through it, we can be, and we can be open and vulnerable about about what's happening with us, then that's where the support comes for the other people. That's where we can be of service to others. It's not a theoretical piece. As you alluded earlier, I mean, I love Aubrey Marcus. Um, He was my target to come on, but he politely said, no, thanks. I'm not doing that stuff at the moment. Doesn't mean he's still not on my target list. Um, I'm I'm still going to land him. I I just chose to sit back and not not harass him, but maybe next year there's a lot more harassment into that space. But you know, I love, I read the same book, you know, and, and, you know, there's some beautiful stuff in that, you know, um, own, own the day, own your life. And so, yes, there was a whole other thing that, uh, um, you know, they're just human. We're all human. You know, so it's just because this person wrote a book or that person wrote a book, they still experience life as a human. They still get angry, frustrated, upset, happy, joyous, you know, um, all these things still happen because these are all human emotions that we actually go through. So um, that's been really cool. You've also been very generous with your time. Um, the fact is if it's getting dark means it's also getting towards dinner time and you do to have uh, two beautiful oh, young yeah. boys to, to be able to have dinner with. So do you want to just give a, a bit of a, you know, what would it be a, a message that you feel you could uh, maybe leave either for couples or for men about you know what you think they could actually uh, you know do or the next steps um, for them as a bit of a takeaway from this conversation. Yeah, absolutely. Firstly, thank you for having me on. We're really, really grateful, really humble, and it's been a pleasure. Um, one of the big things, and when you were just talking, then that really came to me, and it, it's a sort of a quote that I have, it just sort of came to me a while ago when I started this coaching stuff and I tend to live by it and it comes up with every single client I work with and every single person that's not a client that I've talked to is the idea of verbalise before we irrationalise. And it doesn't mean we don't take the time to be able to verbalise without the anger or the frustration or the things that are triggering us. But like you just said with your partner, if you wait a few days the things will start to fester in your mind, like, okay, what's going on? Like, you know, have I done this or have I done that or have I done this? And, you know, it's like, I don't know if you've seen that meme going around. I don't know if it's going around anymore, but does that, you know, the, the, the guy is sleeping in the bed, he's just half asleep and there's the, the lady next to him and it's like the caption's like, what's he thinking? It's like, always well, the joke, oh, he's thinking about the footy or seeing about this, but she, you know, originally it was like she's, he's thinking about another guy or, sorry, he's thinking about another girl. And that's the perfect encapsulation of, of verbalising before you rationalise. You know, like she could easily just ask the question. And you're like, no. It's like, okay, cool. Um, and so just being able to verbalise that. And that comes with vulnerability. So even individuals and myself, verbalising, I'm going to show what my fears are. I'm going to express what I'm struggling with. I'm going to express what my wins are. And I'm going to celebrate my, my joy. But I'm also going to, you know, be open and vulnerable, like I'm struggling with X, Y, and Z, or I need some help with this. Because when we don't express and we don't verbalise these things, they do start to explode. They become massive issues. They add to our imposter syndrome or they they cause massive tension if it's in relationships with couples. Um, yeah, so that idea of just verbalising before we irrationalise 
I think is is a really, really good thing. And just show up every single day and don't worry about what the outcome is. They're probably the three biggest things. Verbalise before you rationalise. Show up every single day and stop worrying about the outcome. Awesome, man. Um, beautiful. I think that's that's a beautiful wrapped up message. Um, you know, for, for me, this is why I love having these conversations because every man drops this beautiful nuggets of wisdom. You know, someone could just take ex- those three things away and fundamentally change their life just by putting up those as three mantras, plain and simple. That that that's a path just to go on. So, you know, we could read all the books and everything else, or just grab those three. And you go, this is how I'm now going to live my life. You know, and you'd be amazed how, how much your, your life would change and, and how how um how much freedom you'd actually get out of that and, and just how much you know ease that your life would run with. Uh so Sean, look, I'm really glad that we connected. I'm really glad we're able to to land on. I know that we've been speaking for a few months about the timing of the podcast. Um, yeah. Again, universally, I think it landed exactly where it was meant to be. I'm so happy Why that it was, uh, you know, on on episode 50. Um, for me, it, it's a beautiful milestone. I'm extremely proud of. I'm really happy that you were able to share um, this episode with me. I wish you and Carissa and Teddy and Aubrey uh, all the best over in Costa Rica. Um, I hope you have a, a beautiful night. Go and enjoy a beautiful dinner, and definitely we'll stay in touch and we'll chat again soon. Thank you, Will. I really appreciate it, mate. And everything is divine timing. It's beautiful and just so humbled and so grateful for this opportunity. Yeah, thank you so much, man. Really, really appreciate it. No worries. And as we start off, sending you much love because uh, I love you as a, as a brother and, and as um, someone that also inspires me. So much love, man. Take care. Much love, brother. Right back at you. So folks, uh, that's a wrap for episode 50. And again, I'm extremely grateful to have had Sean uh, come on board. You know, uh, our, I've only probably known Sean for the last six odd months. Um, but yeah, I've just loved exactly his journey, what he's doing, uh, what he's doing with Chris around couples. Um, hugely inspired with, with all the chaos that's going around the world that, you know, they made a, a decision to pack up and head to Costa Rica from Sydney. It just shows you that you know, take control of your life. Like there's a lot of stuff and we can we can project and we spoke a bit about in this episode, but like they just took control of their life and they said our life is now in Costa Rica and they just made it happen. So, you know, that that in itself is just a beautiful example of, of the of the man he is and, and of Carissa and, you know, their boys will walk out of this with an amazing experience. So I love the fact that he did that and there's been inspiration I'm taking from that as to our my journey. So um, just to wrap up, as you know, you can find me on Facebook, LinkedIn, and Instagram, or uh, look up theunearthedman.com. Uh, that's it for episode 50 of The Unearthed Man, sending you much love and peace. Milbo. No